Mary Robertson is a retired Plano ISD librarian. She's been a member of the Richland College adjunct faculty since 2004. Currently, she's a lecturer in the Emeritus Program. Uh, since retiring from the Independent School District, Mary has had some amazing experiences while volunteering for disaster relief and for the National Park Service. Uh, she helped write and acted in historical skits as part of the weekly living history programs at Fort Spokane, Washington. Mary may be the only person you know that ever helped decorate a float for the Rose Parade. In 2007, she worked on the La Cunada Flint Ridge float for eight hours under a freeway overpass. Her main job was pasting gladiolas and carnation petals on the hat of a walrus. Uh, her love of history and travel combined for wonderful adventures to historical sites. She's visited every state in the United States as well as many international destinations over five continents. She's the mother of three grown sons, Nana to eight, grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Please welcome Mary Robertson. Hello. I'm so glad you could join us today as we look at the history of Santa Claus. And no, that's not Santa Claus on the screen. That's me under an overpass in Pasadena, Texas, working on that uh, Rose Parade float that Richard mentioned a few minutes ago. The, uh, those are white gladiola uh, petals and red carnation petals that I'm going to be pasting on that hat. It takes about eight hours to very carefully disassemble a gladiola and paste the petals on, and it takes a lot of gladiolas to cover that. But it's well worth it because here at the Rose Parade is my walrus hat right in the middle of the float on top of that big old walrus. If you ever get a chance to volunteer to help decorate floats for the Rose Parade, I highly recommend it. They need hundreds of volunteers at the last minute to put the fresh petals on because they can't put them on more than 24 hours ahead or they, they fade too much. Now let's look at the history of Santa Claus. And today I'm using information that I found in the autobiography of Santa Claus by Jeff Gwynn. This Jeff Gwynn was the only person Santa Claus trusted to tell his story. And there are some great stories in here that I think you will enjoy today. But the images that I have on the screen are the three Santa Clauses over the, the centuries. The one on the left is the uh, Bishop Santa Claus, uh, St. Nicholas in his robes. And the middle is Santa Claus, the Dutch Santa Claus from the uh, colonial period. And on the right is the more modern Santa Claus like the children will see at the malls and at various places over the holiday period. But let's look at St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas was a boy bishop. He was born in Myra, Turkey around AD 230. And he was a very fortunate boy. He had loving parents. They were very well to do. And then both his parents died quite suddenly. And he was left alone, but a very wealthy young boy. His feast day is December 6th. And that marks the day he died in 343 AD. The, um, when he is orphaned and goes to live with his uncle, he's living in a monastery. He's living in a, a religious order where he is well taken care of and, and loved. And he begins to realize watching his uncle and his ministry that there are many people with great needs and his wealth could help some of those people. So he starts looking for ways that he could share his wealth. And he talks to his uncle and he said, well, that's something you need to work out yourself. I agree that that would be a good idea to share your wealth, but I want you to think about how to do it. And one of the, the families that he had seen that he felt needed help was a poor farmer who had three daughters and he had no dowry for his daughters. In those days, without a dowry, you couldn't marry. And not only could you not marry, if the family was destitute enough, often the young girls were sold into slavery to help the rest of the family. And Nicholas did not want that to happen to these three girls. And so he's trying to come up with a way to give the money to them without them knowing where it came from. Because when he told his uncle what he wanted to do, he said, you can't embarrass that farmer by just giving him money. And if you just give the farmer money, he could spend it on something besides the dowries too. You've got to do it in a way 
that the they know it's for the diaries, reserved for the diaries, and it doesn't embarrass the farmer. So young Nicholas is trying to think of what to do. Now he's probably 10 by now. So he's a very creative young man. And he decides one night when there is no moon that he is going to go to the house, going to take a ladder from the barn, take it to the, the girls' houses. He's going to climb up to the window and get the money into their rooms. He's thinking of putting it in the pockets of their robe, but he doesn't even know if women's robes have pockets. But anyway, he's got the ladder, he goes to the house, and oh, right here I need to tell you, there are no chimneys at this time. That's an uh, architectural detail that we will find in the colonies several hundred years later, but not now. There are windows around the top of the house that, that provide ventilation to suck the smoke up and out of the house. So he goes over, he puts the ladder against, well, it takes him a while to figure out which window to put it against because he doesn't want to go into the farmer's bedroom. Puts it against the window that he thinks could be the girl's bedroom and he scurries up the ladder and he gets to the top and he realizes, wait a minute, I have to figure out how to get down into the room and then get back up to get out of the house. How am I going to do that? And he realizes if he pulls the ladder up into the room, drops it down, goes down, puts the money in, then pulls the ladder up, he can get back out. Okay, that's where, oh, wait a minute, there is one little problem here. He is in the farmer's bedroom, not the girl's bedroom, and the farmer is waking up. And as the farmer is starting to shout, Nicholas pushes the ladder back out, scurries down it, makes a loud noise when he falls coming down that ladder, and then runs back to the monastery. Now, what is he going to do? How is he going to figure this out? The next morning while Nicholas is eating breakfast, his uncle comes in and he says to Nicholas, uh, he's laughing and Nicholas said, what's going on? What is so funny? And he says to Nicholas, you remember that farmer that you wanted to help? Last night somebody broke into his house and he was really lucky. He was able to fight all nine of them off with just one stick. Nine burglars tried to rob that poor farmer. One little 10-year-old boy with a ladder was what was there, not nine burglars. Nicholas had to go back and work on his plan to come up with an idea that would be safer for him and not wake up the farmer again. So he waited until there was another dark night, and he took the ladder and he went back. This time he was much smoother at getting up the ladder, getting down into and he found the girl's room this time. That was a big help. And he, oh, wait a minute, there's stockings hanging in front of the fireplace. That's much better than trying to figure out if they have pockets in their robes. Everybody hung their stockings in front of the fireplace at night because they usually had only one or two pairs. So almost every night they were washing stockings and hanging them by the fireplace. So he carefully puts the money for each girl in their own stocking. So when they woke up the next morning, they knew what that money was for. And everybody was so excited and pleased for the girls, especially their sweethearts that had been wanting to marry them, but couldn't because of the lack of dowry. Now, you can imagine people in the village soon heard that there had been a gift giver that had come by the farmer's house and left money for each of the girls. When it happened a second time and someone else received an unexpected gift in the middle of the night, people began to realize that there was a gift giver out there and if they knew what you needed, they would come and leave it. So people started sitting out on their porches or their front doorstep and waiting to see if the gift giver came down the street and they could give him their list of desires. Kind of like the children today make a list and take it to Santa Claus. Nicholas was also known as a protector of children and of sailors. He was a patron saint of countries like Russia and Greece, and orphans were a special area of ministry for him. He also was a strong prayer partner warrior, and he loved to share the truth of the scripture with anyone that would listen. He was a very popular priest and at a very young age became a bishop. The, uh, but then, 
after the story of St. Nicholas and the gift giving during that time period became more of a tradition, and they were giving the gifts on December 6th, his feast day, the Protestant Reformation happened in the 16th century and Catholic saints were banned in Germany and in England. So parents who wanted to have that gift giving time for their children had to come up with other ideas. And in England, it would be Father Christmas. And you see him here with a pack of toys and treats for the children. In Germany, it will be the Christmas man who will help the Christ child give gifts. In France, Pierre Noel placed cake, cookies, and candies out. And in Russia, Father Frost gave gifts in January, not in December. And here are images of each of those uh, gift givers, the French on the left, the Russian Father Frost on the bottom. But on the right, on the right side, the top, I want you to notice the, Christ, the Christ child is the gift giver. And that was until the... the German mothers said, wait a minute, you cannot send a baby out on a cold night by himself. And so that's where the Christmas man came up so that he could accompany the baby Jesus. In other parts of the, the world, uh, other countries, there were different uh, traditions. In Holland particularly, the children would put uh, food for St. Nicholas and straw for his donkey in their shoes. And you see here a big pair of wooden shoes. They hoped that the next morning those treats would be gone and there would be treats for them. And all around the world, people still had to do laundry. So stockings in front of the chimney were a favorite place to receive the treats. Now, you would think that this country would have had Christmas and celebrated it from the time we were colonies. That's not the case. When we were colonies, uh, Christmas was just another day. In fact, our Congress met on Christmas Day many times in our early history as a country. Part of that is because the Puritans from England had a great aversion to holiday celebrations, and particularly the fall festival and the Christmas holiday. One of the reasons is most of the Puritans that came at that time were upper class uh, landowners, sort of the lord of the manor. And they had many people that worked for them during the year. And when the crops came in at the end of the, the harvest, they would have a fall festival or harvest festival. And this was the celebration that became combined with Christmas. The thing is, if you were the Lord of the Manor, you could expect the workers to come calling to get their reward for a good harvest. The song that's on the screen now is one we sing all the time. And it's a happy song the way we sing it. But if you can imagine yourself as the Lord of the Manor and your house is surrounded by a mob of workers demanding their treat for bringing in the good harvest. The song sounded something like this. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good tidings we bring to you and your kin. Good tidings for Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, bring us a figgy pudding. Oh, bring us a figgy pudding. Oh, bring us a figgy pudding and a cup of good cheer. We won't go till we get some. We won't go till we get some. We won't go till we get some. So bring it right here. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now, figgy pudding was considered a treat. It was not something that most of the poor workers had. So when they came asking for their treat and demanding their treat, this was the one they wanted, figgy pudding. Can you imagine if you were in the manor house surrounded and they were demanding and they won't go till they get some? That was not a popular song in New England, no. But today we sing it as a happy song. Really, Christmas was not celebrated in the colonies for a long time. And Washington Irving would write one of the first books that actually describes Santa Claus or Santa Claus, the Dutch pronunciation of Santa Claus. The, uh, and he's going to be talking about that little round jolly man uh, in his knee breeches smoking his pipe. 
and he's going to be the first one that describes the gift giving and the horse drawn wagging as they drop off gifts down the chimney because now there are chimneys in the colonies and this happens on uh, St. Nicholas Eve so that would be December 5th they would drop them down. But the real image that we get from Santa Claus, more like what we know today, is the one from Clement Moore. Now, Clement Moore was like many authors of children's literature. He was a serious scholar. He's a New York professor of theology and a bishop of the Episcopal Church. He writes scholarly books and, and articles, and he only writes poems and things for the children as special treats for his children. He never imagined that they would become something that we would be reading hundreds of years later. A Visit from St. Nicholas was the name of the, the poem when he wrote it. And he wrote it coming home from uh, New York City one day. It's snowing and, and he's feeling like he needs something special for his children for that night's festival. By the time he gets home, it's almost all put together in his mind and he writes it out and he shares it with his children and some friends and their children that night. But it's not published until later in the Troy, New York Sentinel, and it's going to be several years later, and it's going to be published anonymously. The image on the screen right now is one of the early illustrations of a visit from St. Nicholas, and he doesn't sign it. They think that the person that gave it to the Troy Sentinel is actually one of the guests that was there that night that had made a copy of it. And, uh, but he gives us a description of Santa that we see even today. Here's some other images so you see the great variety of illustrations of the poem that we now call The Night Before Christmas. My very favorite of that is the Jan Brett version. And Jan Brett is a contemporary illustrator of children's books. She does wonderful stories. And she has so many ideas for her pictures that there's always a center picture and then smaller pictures around the edge. Here you see a very Victorian New England house with the sleigh up on the roof. And that is the main center picture. Then you have pictures on the side. There's the stockings hanging by the chimney. The, uh, her illustrations are beautiful. One of my favorites is the reindeer and the elves as they play while Santa works. And you see Santa in one of the side images putting the gifts out and eating the treats that the children have left for him. If you're reading this poem to your children, there are some things that you probably need to explain. Some terms that we don't really use much today. Uh, I want to read just a couple of the, the verses. The children were nestled all snug in their beds with visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. Sugar plums are not a fruit, it's a hard candy. It's a candy that's layers of, of sugar that they dip it, they let it dry, they dip it, they let it dry. The closest thing we have to it now would be something like a, a jawbreaker that has different layers inside. The, uh, so there, and, but these were real treats then because they do are very time consuming to make. The um, next line is, and mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. A lot of children find this humorous because who goes to bed with their cap on? Well, you did in New England because in those days you didn't have central heat and it was cold up there. And the fire was usually bedded down for the night so that sparks wouldn't fly out and set the house on fire. So the house could get very cold during the night. And you could snuggle up under lots of blankets and, and quilts. But your head had to stick out so you could breathe. So the answer to keep your head warm was to wear your cap and your kerchief to bed at night. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. You remember I said it was really cold? Well, that's why the shutters were on the inside of those rooms in the cold New England at that time. And before you went to bed at night, you closed and latched the shutters. The sash is something else. 
that's the weights that keep the help the the window to go up and down and is so if you throw up the window you're throwing up the sash as it were and that makes it it's another thing to to layer to keep the room warm but it's also you've got to get the window up to be able to see what's out on the lawn and the last thing that need, that I want to mention from there is and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose the um, that's the way they explain that Santa Claus can get out of the rooms. It's a whole lot easier than little Nicholas trying to get the ladder up and down on either side. Now, this is the first time that we're talking about Christmas Eve instead of December 6th. And it's also the first time that we've named the reindeers and said how Santa could get around. And the interesting thing about the names of the reindeer, uh, listen to them. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Pranson and Vixen. On Comet, on Cupid, on Donna and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. Did you notice on there that all of the words for the names of the reindeer denote strength and endurance, dasher, dancer, except there's one that is not a masculine name, Vixen. Vixen is the only female on that, in that eight sub, but all of the others are strong names and Donner and Blitzen mean thunder and lightning. So that also is very strong. But before they came up with the eight reindeers, how did Santa Claus get around? In the book, Santa Claus by Jeff Gwynn, Santa Claus is going to dictate his autobiography to Jeff and it explains a lot of things like how did they get around so much and um, tells about Santa's adventures. For instance, it tells that Santa doesn't really know how he gets as far as he does on Christmas Eve because it's magic. He starts out walking and he walks as fast as he can and does as many as he can and amazingly enough, he's done by morning. That's the only explanation that you get. So people got very creative with ideas like the hot air balloon you see here or the reindeer pulling a small sleigh, which doesn't seem to have any toys in it. Don't understand that. You also have St. Nicholas walking beside the donkey and the donkey's carrying all of the animals. You never see Santa Claus riding a donkey. He's always walking beside the donkey. And Jeff Gwynn asked him about that. And he said, well, I didn't think I would want to carry Uncle, he named the donkey Uncle, I didn't think I would want to carry Uncle around all night and I sort of thought he didn't want to carry me. So we walked together. Now in England you see him riding on a white stallion and one of my favorite ideas is the one in the lower right. They have a team of geese attached to the sleigh as they fly over the land. But then of course, after the night before Christmas, we're introduced to the ninth reindeer, Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer. And interestingly enough, he is a pretty modern character and he was created for Montgomery Ward uh, by Robert May. Robert May is an employee of Montgomery Wards and every year they do a giveaway or a special sale item. Some years it was free, some years they paid. And they had commissioned Robert May, one of their regular employees, to come up with a, a idea that year. Now he's got two thoughts. He wants it to be Christmassy, but he wants it to be encouraged, encouragement for children that are being bullied because as a child he had been bullied. And Rudolph, as a young reindeer, is bullied. And then he comes into his own when he comes to Santa's rescue. Now, as an employee of Montgomery Ward's, he will not receive uh, the copyright for it, Montgomery Ward does. And interestingly enough, the year that he's given that commission, he and his wife and daughter are working on it. It's kind of a family collaboration. And then his wife gets sick with cancer and, and she will die during the time they're working on the project. And Montgomery Wards comes to him and said, uh, we understand your wife's ill. We understand this is a very difficult time. Why don't we give this commission to someone else and you can do one another year? 
but we kind of think this may be too much. And he said, oh, please don't take it away from us because it, it's something we can focus on besides her illness. And after she died, it was something that he and his daughter could finish together. And so they did, and it became very popular. They would give away 2.4 million copies in 1939 alone. Now remember, he doesn't have the copyright so when he's approached a few years later by a company that want to do a, a different kind of book, uh, a storyline, uh, he can't do the deal because Montgomery Ward owns the patent or the copyright. Montgomery Ward hears about the offer that's been made to him and they know he still has debts from his wife's illness. And so they decide as an organization that they will give him the copyright. Because, I mean, they've sold millions of copies. It's not like they're giving away a ton of money, except they don't know that it's going to become a very popular Christmas song. And they have to do some editing to make it a song, but they do. And it turns out that his new wife's brother is a songwriter and a performer. And yes, he did marry about three years after his first wife died. He did marry, they had several more children, so his little girl will have siblings to grow up with. And her brother's wife knows Jean Autry's wife and is going to approach him about doing the song. Well, Jean Autry, like everybody else that they've approached, says no. It's, this is not a hit song. This is, who would want to sing this song? And so he turns them down. But then his wife comes back to him and says, Gene, you're always looking for songs to put on the back side of big hits. And I think this would be a perfect song and it would encourage them and it would give them some exposure. And he thinks about it and he said, well, you're right. I could put it on the back side of one that I'm sure is going to be a big hit. So Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer became the flip side of if it doesn't snow on Christmas. Now we all know what happened. Rudolph became a major hit, and if we don't, if it don't, doesn't snow on Christmas is one that I've never even heard. This song would become one of the very popular Christmas songs, second only to Bing Crosby's White Christmas at that point. And in 1964, it's even going to become a TV movie with Burl Ives singing the song. There are other songs that relate to Santa Claus that, that fall into the myth of the Santa Claus. And one is Santa Claus is Coming to Town. An interesting thing about it, it's first sung on Eddie Cantor's radio show in November 1934. Now, that time they did not record all of the radio shows. Uh, the uh, White Christmas was sung by Bing Crosby the first time and not recorded because they didn't know it was going to be a hit. Santa Claus is Coming to Town, not recorded because it, they don't know it's going to be a hit. The switchboards lit up. People were demanding copies of sheet music and, and would it be played or recorded again. So each of those would become major uh, successes after being sung one time on a radio show. It will eventually sell over 500,000 copies of sheet music and over 30,000 records in only 24 months after it came out. Now it's gonna add a number of things to the, the story of Christmas. And one is that Santa Claus is watching and taking notes on good little boys and girls and he is going to be coming to town. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making his list and checking it twice. Got to find out who's naughty and nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. It goes on in the same vein. This is the first time we've thought about Santa Claus keeping a list of boys and girls that are naughty and nice. And I can tell you, even when I was a child, parents were using that, oh, from the beginning of October all the way through Christmas to get children to behave, to behave themselves. In 1970, there's going to be a new animated cartoon with Fred Astaire as the little elf that's singing the song, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. It's also been used as background music in many movies, including Elf, 
which is a very contemporary movie and in many of the Santa Claus franchise by the Disney Corporation. Michael Buble is one of the most recent artists to release this song and it keeps it as a uh, perpetual favorite. Now, we're going to have to have some other images. When uh, Clement Moore wrote The Night Before Christmas, he gives a great description of Santa Claus, but the poem was not illustrated, so other people's ideas have come along. And Thomas Ness is going to be one that really adds to the images of Santa Claus, as he is the uh, political cartoonist in Harper's Weekly. And this is one of the Dutch, the Santa Claus images that he is going to paint. He is a political cartoonist and many of his cartoons will deal with the Civil War because that's the period that he's most active. And this one on Christmas Eve, you have the soldier on the right wishing he was home and the family on the left praying for his safety. A similar one later where the, the soldier is actually able to be home for Christmas and the children are so excited to see their father. But the one that nearly broke the back of the Confederacy is the one in, in 1863 where Santa Claus is in the Union camp handing out gifts to the Union soldiers and their children. And it's just, if Santa Claus is on the side of the Union, how could the Confederacy ever win? It really was a morale booster for the Union and buster for the Confederacy. Santa's been used in many uh, morale boosters for our troops during various wars. This is World War I, and it's Santa with the Doughboys, peace, your gift to the nation. And here, World War II, Santa Claus has gone to war. Your gift, plenty of weapons, the inland way for the USA and that was getting people, the factories converted to manufacturing weapons and planes and ships that would be needed uh, for that time period. One of the illustrators, and people often debate whether Norman Rockwell is an artist or an illustrator, he said he only painted what he saw. He did not create new images, he just painted what he saw, and there he is doing his self-portrait. But Norman Rockwell would paint Saturday Evening Post covers, and he had wonderful covers. We always looked forward to the Post to see what the new cover was. And this is one for Christmas that this, there are a couple of things here. Santa Claus has got his magnifying glass. He's planning his route for Christmas Eve. And in his hand, there is a book of the good little boys. The, uh, there are other things that we find on the, the Norman Rockwell covers that are new ideas. One is he definitely has a list of the good little boys and girls, and there is Santa on the left adding good, na good names to the list. On the right, it's the idea of Santa Claus making all the toys and the help of the elves as he's working to get ready for Christmas Eve, and he's a tired Santa kind of taking a nap there. There are many countries that honored Santa Claus uh, with postage stamps, like, and they're all images from Norman Rockwell's Saturday Evening Post. There's Nevis, Rwanda, and Granada had several that they recognized the Santa Claus. The other man that gave us images that are current with what we see today or think of when we say Santa Claus was Hayden Sunbloom, who was the painter for the Coca-Cola Santa Clauses. And here you show him with one of his neighbors, a little girl, that is going to be a model in several of his, his Coca-Cola ads. And he will paint those Coca-Cola ads from 1931 to 1964. The one on the left in this image is the very first one he did in 1931. And the thing that's interesting is here we're getting into times of the Depression, we're getting in times when money's short, and so he couldn't afford to buy a new canvas and start over in 1933. So he took the 1931 image and he just changed it a little to make it the 1933 image. You see in 1931 he does not have a hat on and he's holding a bottle of Coca-Cola and the, the catchphrase was, my hat's off, the, uh, the pause that refreshes. 
But in 1933, he switches the bottle of Coca-Cola for a glass of Coca-Cola. He puts the hat on and he paints a big furry on the sleeve to cover up the, where he's had to take the hat out for the belt and he's holding the, the whip that he would use in the, the sleigh. So it's the very same image, just doctored, so he didn't have to spend as much on the canvas or the paints. The other thing that he did, I mentioned that he used neighbors for models. Uh, the year that he, the Santa Claus, the man that had modeled for his Santa Claus died, he didn't have time to find another model. So Sunbloom became his own model and put, had a picture, a mirror in front of him and painted from the mirror. And as it turns out, this is the mirror image which they used for the ads. The, sad, the, the bad thing about that is his muscles facing the wrong way, his belt's facing the wrong way, everything is backwards. But Coca-Cola didn't catch it. Nobody caught it until it was out in all the magazines and they start getting letters from people pointing it out. He found another Santa before the next Christmas because he realized mirror images wouldn't work. There are a number of things that, that they will do in those ads. Uh, one is to try to boost the morale of the soldiers during the war. This one is Sprite Boy. Here's to our G.I. Joes. Today, I know you're wondering why Sprite Boy isn't holding a bottle of Sprite. Sprite wasn't around in the 40s. Sprite Boy was just a character that they used in the ads. The, uh, there are several images that we all like of, of this Coca-Cola. The one on the left is a very traditional uh, Santa with the toys. Bottom right is the young girl, his neighbor, in, in one of her ads. And the top right is one of my favorites because do you remember those big square boxes that held the Coke and they were all down in the water? My parents owned a grocery store and one of my chores sometime was to refill that. And I have fond memories of that Coca-Cola uh, container that in the store. His final Sandbloom Christmas Santa Claus was 1964. And you see it's come a long way since that one in 1931 with all of the toys and the images. Now that is the end of the slides that I have for you today. But I wasn't going to read the Night Before Christmas to you in the total book. But I am going to read you the Cajun night before Christmas because I grew up in a part of the country where we had a lot of Cajuns. And James Rice found that if he illustrated the story and put it in the, the terms of the, the dialects of the different parts of the country, people loved and related to the, the poem. And of course, you will see the landscape of the Cajun country. Twas the night before Christmas. And all through the house, they don't a thing pass, not even a mouse. The chillin' done been nestled good snug on the floor, and Mama passed the pepper through the crack on the door. Then Mama in the fireplace done roast up the ham, stir up the gumbo, and make bacon the yams. Then out on the bayou that got such a clatter, make sound like old Boudreaux done fall off his ladder. I run like a rabbit that got to the door, trip over the dog and fall on the floor. As I look out the door in the light of the moon, I think, man, you're crazy. I got old too soon. Cause there on the bayou where I stretch my neck stiff, there's eight alligator a pulling the skiff and a little fat drover with a long pulling stick, I know right way got to be old St. Nick. More faster and faster the gator they came, he whistled and hollered and called them by name. Hey Gaston, hey Thibon, hey Pierre and Elsie, Gisonette, Gisuzette, Celeste and Renee. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, make crawl alligator and be sure you don't fall. Like Tante Flo's cat through the treetop, he fly when the big old hound dog come run itself by. Like that up the porch, them old gator they climb with a skiff full of toys and St. Nicholas behind. 
get on top of the porch roof. It sounded like a hail when all them big gator done sot down their tail. Then down the chimney I yell with the bam and St. Nicholas fall and sat on the yams. Sacre! he exclaimed. My pants got a hole. I done set myself on them red hot coals. He got on his foots and jumped like a cat out to the floor where he land with a splat. He was dressed in muskrat from his head to his foot and his clothes is all dirty with ashes and soot. A sack full of plaything he trod on his back. He looked like a burglar, that for a fact. His eyes, how they shine, his dimple, how merry. Maybe he'd been drinking the wine from Blackberry. His cheek was like rose, his nose like a cherry. On second thought, maybe he lapped up the sherry. With snow white chin whiskers and quivering belly, he shook when he laughed like a strawberry jelly. But a wink in his eye and a shook of his head made my confidence that I don't got to be scared. He don't do no talking, gone straight to his work, put plaything in sock and then turned with a jerk. He put both his hands there on top of his head, cast an eye on the chimney, and then he done said, with all of that fire and them burning hot flame, me ain't going back by the way that I came. So he run out the door and he climbed to the roof. He ain't no fool him for to make one more goof. He jump in his skiff and crack his big whip. The gator moved down and don't make one slip. And I hear him shout loud as a splashing he goes, Merry Christmas to all till I see you some more. Now originally Clement Moore said, Happy Christmas to all. But Merry Christmas works really well too. I hope you've enjoyed learning more about Santa Claus and his history. Thank you. Thank you.